Now, our speaker tonight isn't going to tell you how to keep from breaking your arm in a bathtub. But he is going to tell us something that he's eminently qualified to tell us, and that's how to keep from breaking our neck at the crossroads. Dr. Nicholas Nayarty was born and educated in Hungary. He held the position of Undersecretary of Treasury and Minister of Finance in the Republic of Hungary until 1948, when he and his wife were forced to flee their country. He is presently director of the School of International Studies at Bradley University, Peoria, Illinois. His topic tonight is At the Crossroads. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Nayarati. Last month, while I was on my way to a commencement address, I was driving and my car developed engine trouble on the winding highways of southern Indiana. It was late at night, and the rain was pouring, and I was hopeless and helpless. Not that I didn't know exactly what was wrong with my car, but there wasn't a thing in the world what I could have done about it. Car manufacturers in Detroit are so confident about the quality of their makes that they fail to include even as much as a screwdriver in the equipment. So I stood there on the edge of the road and on the edge of despair when suddenly one of those huge interstate trucks drove by, stubbed, and its driver, one of those kind, always smiling American truck drivers, readily climbed out from his cab to give me a helping hand in my trouble. And as the trucker was working on my engine, we started a conversation. I still don't know how it happened, but believe you me that it didn't take him more than about 15 minutes to discover, or rather 15 seconds to discover, that the way I was talking wasn't with what you might call exactly a Midwestern accent. So he suddenly looked at me and said to me, by the way, buddy, what the hell are you doing here in the United States? I said to him, well, buddy, this is a rather complicated question to answer. Because I was originally the Secretary of the Treasury, the Minister of Finance of the Republic of Hungary. And when the Russians took over this unfortunate native land of mine, Stalin didn't like me. I didn't like Stalin. They passed the death sentence over my head. I got offended and I escaped Hungary. And I told him that I am a college professor and university administrator as the director of the School of International Studies at Bradley University. Uh, we are trying to train students who one day, we hope at least, will become future diplomats and future export managers. I have the radio and TV programs. I'm writing articles. I wrote a book. And I'm also speaking all over the country at the rate of some 150 speeches or so. Hearing all this, Buddy looked at me and said, wow. <laughs> Isn't this too bad? I thought you are at least a traveling salesman. <laughs> well, the more I think about my conversation with Buddy, the more I think that, after all, he was right. Because you might call me a traveling salesman, although the merchandise I am trying to sell you is not easy to sell, because it is hard because it is cruel, because it is bitter. The name of my merchandise is truth, this horrible, deadly, and bitter truth, as we can witness it today, both in our country and in the world, when our country, ourselves, and our children stand at the crossroads. You know, if I would be a pessimist, which I am not, then the only thing which I could do here today would be to quote to you the famous words of Sir Winston Churchill, this towering giant of our 20th century who told his British people at the darkest hour of the history of that great country when he took over the helm in Britain in the first year of World War II, all that I can promise you is blood, sweat, and tears. However, because I am not a pessimist, just a realist, I am not going to quote to you here Sir Winston Churchill, but I can tell you with full responsibility that there wasn't yet a generation in the almost 200-year-long history of our country which would have to face problems of a greater magnitude and which would have to live 
under the shadow of a more horrible threat than is our generation and our younger generations, our children and our grandchildren today. Now just try to take a look around you. What type of a world do we live in here today? And what type of a country do we live in here today? Here on one side, you have this tragic war in Vietnam still raging, a war which we did not have the courage and the determination to win, and a war which we simply cannot afford to lose. What kind of a world do we live in here today when the leaders of the Soviet Union, although playing lip service to disarmament and agreements, we know it today from the reports of the President and of the Secretary of Defense, that they are bending over backward and making superhuman efforts to develop such a nuclear striking capability for Russia that which, if we either won't be able to limit through an agreement or if we are not going to increase our own defenses accordingly, would lead to the point that the Soviet Union in five years today at the pressing of a button will be able to destroy 97% of our own defensive capability and will be able to kill as many as 130 million Americans. And what type of world do we live in here today when Mao Zedong, the leader of 750 million Chinese, told his people only a month ago that within the next 10 years they will have to be ready for an all-out war, World War III, against the United States. And what type of world do we live in here today when our American economy is undergoing now a serious crisis because the American people didn't make up their minds yet what they want. Whether they want to continue with this deadly inflation, which is taking out now up to 6% of the purchasing power of the dollar in our bank accounts and in our pocketbooks, or they want to stop it. Because they have to make now the choice, what do they want? Do they want a fistful of banknotes in their pockets, the value of which is constantly deteriorating, or do they want a stable currency, but less of it in their pockets? Because if we are not going to be able to stop, or at least to slow down considerably, the suicidal spiral of inflation, that I can tell you with full responsibility that in 30 years from now, in the year of 2000, our children and our grandchildren will have to pay $10 for a man's haircut. At least at that time, the hippies will have a good excuse for growing their hair long. In 30 years from today, our children and our grandchildren will have to pay $750 for a man's woolen suit. And in the year 2000, if they want to buy themselves or their families a Chevy or a Ford, the going price of these makes will be $15,000. And what type of a world do we live in here today when our big city streets are turned into battlefields, when buildings are being burned, when shops are being looted, when store windows are being cracked, when the police who are being called the pigs are shut or sniped at. And what type of a world do we live in here today when our colleges, universities, and even some of our major high schools have now completely done away with the traditional paraphernalia of learning, with the books, with the blackboard, and with the chalk, and have introduced instead the firebomb, the bicycle chain, and the Molotov cocktail instead? And perhaps the greatest tragedy which has befallen upon our country and our people is that our people are today like the babes in the woods. They have no idea what caused us to get here to this point. They are groping desperately for some kind of solutions, for some kind of answers to their problem. There was never more of a hostility and negativism in this country. People are against people, groups are against groups, ideologies are against ideologies, and we just do not know what happened to us. And ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you that perhaps the greatest tragedy of all this, what I told you today, consists of the fact that all what we witnessed today did not happen to us because we would have been betrayed. 
All what happened to us was not because we would have been sold down the river, we would have been handed over to the tender mercy of some kind of a hostile power on a silver platter. No, what happened to us was strictly and exclusively because of the ignorance, the, in, the indifference, the apathy, the taking for granted attitude of millions and of millions of honest, straightforward, and good-willing Americans, just like you and me. Now just try to take a look, ladies and gentlemen, at this incredible bewilderment which you see today in America today. Well, only two months ago, the president, in his role as a supreme commander of our armed forces, ordered the cleaning out of these Cambodian sanctuaries from where the life of our soldiers, of our boys, was being threatened. What was the answer to this of the majority of the Senate? The Senate has adapted a resolution by which the President would be denied the necessary funds for such operations. Now, just as comparison, ladies and gentlemen, imagine what would have happened that when in the early spring of 1945, General Eisenhower's troops crossed the River Rhine, established there the Rehbagen bridgehead, were crashing across the Siegfried Line, and were actually poised for the final victory, that this would have been the time when in 1945 the Senate of the United States would have voted to cut off the funds from General Eisenhower's crusade in Europe. Now, of course, you can say that there was a difference between this situation and ours today, sure, because at that time this country was fighting against Nazism, which was good, but today it is fighting against communism, which is seemingly bad. Now, what kind of a confusion is this? Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you look, for instance, today, what was going on in Washington, this is what I brought with me, the Washington Evening Star, a report around the Washington Monument where the honor America Day was held. The greatest potential worry to police officials is a marijuana smoke in threatened by radical leader Rennie Davis and the dishonor America Day announced by the black United Front here. Dishonor America. Now, ladies and gentlemen, isn't this amazing that so many people, when they heard about that meeting there, said, well, of course, this is nothing else but the meeting of a bunch of super patriots. Now, you see, in my book, patriotism is exactly a similar feeling which you have if you have to love your mother. If you are a patriot, then you love your country, and naturally you love your mother. Now, if you happen to love your country today in the 20th century in America, then you are being called a super patriot. But nobody yet called you for loving your mother a super mother lover. Now, of course, what can we say, for instance, about the incredible confusion which is reigning today in the minds of the American people? Let me tell you, if you go down to the newsstand, you will see the recent 4th of July uh, number of one of our most prominent and distinguished magazines, Newsweek magazine, in which it said that it has asked six distinguished historians to expound their views about the meaning of the 4th of July. And then the magazine says that two of them are leftists, two of them are centrists, and two of them are, so to speak, conservatives. These are the words of the magazine on the first page of its text. Now, of course, the two leftists, notorious individuals, naturally have only one answer, that America has only one choice. It is either democratic socialism or dictatorial socialism, which, of course, as you well know, is communism. But then I really fell back almost off my chair when I read that one of the centrist historians was no one else than the distinguished professor, Dr. Arthur Schlesinger. Well, if you can call Dr. Arthur Schlesinger a centrist, then you can call an elephant a pussycat.
And then, of course, you can ask yourself that in the area of these leftists and the so-called centrists, even the magazine has to admit that it has asked two, so to speak, conservatives. Now, do you really think that there weren't two real conservatives in the academic community of the United States of America? Well, this is today in which one of our most distinguished magazines helps to confuse the American mind. Then, approximately early in May, I was walking through the Bradley University campus, and there was there a sit-in around the ROTC building. <clears throat> Here I noticed several of my students who were also participating. They were very fine young Jewish boys and girls from the East, mostly from New York and New Jersey. So I went to them, and I asked them, well, what are you doing here? And they asked me that they are demonstrating against the industrial military complex because they want America immediately to disarm completely and forget about military power. I said, well, this is very interesting. <clears throat> and did you, young ladies and gentlemen, think about the little interesting thing that today in the Eastern Mediterranean, the Sixth Fleet's presence is the only reason why the Arab states, armed by the Soviet Union, did not yet cut the throat of this brave democratic little country of Israel, which is the apple of your eye. Next day, none of them were present at the demonstrations. <laughs> Then, of course, what would you think about it, ladies and gentlemen, that generally in the whole country today, everybody accepts as a fact that some terrible massacre took place at Kent State University, and everybody blames the Ohio National Guard for murdering their four students. Now, I do not know what happened, but nor do those who already condemn the role of the Guard. Why? We didn't read yet the result of the investigation of the inquest, so that the least what we can do is to reserve our opinion and our judgment for the time when the proper authority come out with the unpartial report of what happened there. But I happen to know what happened there a little bit before, because I happen to know actually that on this particular weekend, First of all, some innocent little children burned down to the ground the ROTC building on Kent State campus. And then the same innocent little children were forming marauding bands on the following Sunday, which then terrorized the peaceful inhabitants of this small Ohio town, setting small fires in the garbage cans, breaking windows, and uh, beating up people. This was the reason why Ohio Governor Rhodes finally called in the National Guard, which came to Kent State not because they wanted to participate there in a Sunday picnic. These were, of course, the events which took place before. So when I thought about all this, I had to remember one of my favorite child time jokes of Hungary, according to which Johnny comes home from grade school, he's all beat up, his clothing is torn, he sports a big black eye, and mother looks at him in horror and says, Johnny, for heaven's goodness sake, were you in a fight? And Johnny says, yes, Charlie beat me up. And mother says, well, Johnny, this is terrible. Didn't I tell you a million times never to fight? And anyhow, who started it? And Johnny answers howling, Charlie started it. He was the first one to hit me back. And of course, ladies and gentlemen, what would you think about this incredible discrepancies and double standards which you see today in connection, for instance, of this opposition to this war which ribbed the fabric of American society more thoroughly than any other event yet in the history of our country? Well, you see, if you look at these incredible discrepancies, you really can't understand it. Now, you just imagine, for instance, when this country was in a war 25 years ago, 
And when you look today at the television sets where those demonstrators are parading under the flags of the North Vietnamese enemy or the communist Viet Cong, just try to imagine what would have happened 25 years ago to a group of young demonstrators who would have paraded on the streets under the swastika emblazoned flag of Nazi Germany or the rising sun flag of Imperial Japan. Those people would have been torn apart alive by their limbs. Who would have dared to suggest 25 years ago that this country should invite Adolf Hitler and the Emperor Hirohito to the negotiating table in order to eke out with them some kind of a compromise settlement? 25 years ago, the president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, created the slogan, unconditional surrender. And that's what it was for the enemy. Now, 25 years ago, you see, there was a willingness to fight, a desire to win, which swept over this country. 25 years ago, there were only two relatively small groups which could have been opposed to the war effort in World War II by this country. The one was the German Nazi Bund here in neighboring New York, which immediately after Pearl Harbor was disbanded, its leaders were arrested and rightly so thrown into jail. Now the other group didn't even oppose the war. The other group were the unfortunate Niseis, the American citizen descendants of earlier Japanese immigrants into California. Well, these unfortunate Niseis, in many instances second and third generation Americans, upon the orders of President Roosevelt, and that time California Attorney General Earl Warren, our recently retired Chief Justice, in a very un-American way were uprooted from their farms and homes in California and were dumped into concentration and detention camps in the East. However, at that time, I just do not remember that anybody would have even battered an eye over this outrageous violation of the constitutional rights of Native American citizens who were sent to concentration camps. You know, at that time, there wasn't one single college professor. There wasn't one single bleeding heart intellectual. There wasn't one single minister of the gospel. You know what? At that time, there wasn't even one single baby doctor who would have deplored that what happened to the constitutional rights of American citizens who were sent into concentration camps. And look at today the contrast, all this belly aching, all this agonizing, all this moralizing, all this legalizing, what are we doing in Vietnam? Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you wouldn't know the answer to this, I am telling it to you. 25 years ago, this country was in a war, World War II, in which it was allied with communist Russia. 25 years ago, this country has saved single-handedly Russia's communist government from total collapse under the pounding of Adolf Hitler's Nazi hordes. So 25 years ago, it was in the interest of the communists that this country should win, that this country should fight, which it did. However, today, when very moderately, very ineffectively, but still this country tries to oppose communist aggression in Vietnam, look at all the hell which is breaking loose. Why? Because today it is in the interest of the communists that this country should lose, that this country should withdraw. Now, you see, 2,000 years ago in the Republic of Rome, when the chief justice of the Republic, the Praetor, presided over a trial, then before the proceedings started, the lictors, the ushers of the court, held high a sign in front of the praetor on which it was written in Latin with a question mark, cui protest, in whose interest is it? In whose interest was the crime committed? In whose interest was the action taken? Now when I see this tremendous discrepancy between what is happening here today and what was the situation 25 years ago, the only thing what I can ask together with the lectors of the Republic of Rome, cui protest, in whose interest is all this, what we see developing under our very own eyes in this country today. Now this of course doesn't mean that I would tell you that those millions and millions of Americans who are opposed and for various reasons to our presence in Vietnam would be all communists. Definitely not. 
But I can tell you also, ladies and gentlemen, that during my seven months long high level ambassadorial mission in Moscow, I came to learn, to fear, and to respect the tremendous effectiveness of Soviet psychological warfare and that of communist brainwashing techniques. What you look around in the world today, you will see that what is happening is nothing else. How millions and millions of Americans, how millions and millions of the peoples of the free nations of the world have been brainwashed unwillingly, unwittingly, and unknowingly by communist propaganda. Now here I have used now a few times the word communist, and I have to explain it. Ladies and gentlemen, take it from me. Communism as a doctrine, as a philosophy, as an economic system, as a governmental formation, is dead as a doornail. Communism was absolutely discredited. None of Karl Marx's predictions came true. It was completely wrong in every single aspect. Now, the best example of this is, if you read only this morning, what your newspapers have printed about the present decision of the uh, Communist Central Committee in Russia, seeing the absolute inadequacy of their farm production, how they are trying to get higher prices for the farmers, how they are trying to improve the food situation for the city workers, and so on. Now, ladies and gentlemen, today the Russian leaders have recognized to such an extent the absolute bankruptcy of communism as an economic uh, feature and an economic system that they are gradually introducing there such capitalistic elements as competition, the profit motive, market research, and all those things which would make Karl Marx today turn like an electric generator in his grave at Highgate Cemetery in London. Now, what is, of course, so very odd, you know, is the fact that very few people really recognize this, that today the Russians are gradually introducing capitalistic methods in order to save socialism. And we in this country, we are gradually introducing socialistic methods in order to save capitalism. Now, you see, if you live long enough, then you will see everything or the opposite of everything. However, the tragedy is here that communism, which is a completely discredited idea, is today the most potent weapon, the most useful instrument, and the best tool in the hands of the two oldest aggressive expansionist and imperialistic countries of the world, namely Russia and China. During their thousand years of history, whenever the legions of these countries tried to overrun some other country, the people always stood up and somehow wanted to defend themselves and their country against aggression. However, today, when those two countries are using as a smoke screen the red flag and the hammer and the sickle, they will have now followers and helpers all over the world because there is a communist party in England, there is a large one in Italy, an even bigger one in France. You find them in various other countries, in India and in many other parts of the world. And you find them here in the United States too. So what actually Russia and China are achieving today is very simple. They use these communist parties around the world as fifth columns to promote the age-old goals of Russian and or Chinese imperialism and aggression. Now, how does this operate now here in our country? We hear constantly the following slogans. Down with the industrial military establishment. Down with the draft. Down with the American free enterprise system. Down with the ROTC. And let's destroy the establishment. Now, what is the establishment which these groups want to destroy? It's very simple. The establishment is our constitutional form of government. The establishment is our free enterprise system. The establishment is our military might. And the establishment is our fundamental belief in God. If you destroy these four pillars of America, then this country, which is the last roadblock, the last barrier, on the road leading towards Russian or and Chinese world domination will be destroyed. 
So what these people today, whom we so euphemistically call militants, radicals, extremists, well, why the heck don't we call them what they themselves admit they are? Communists. This is what they are, and this is what they are doing. They are today working in the interest of these two superpowers which want to achieve world domination and which want to destroy our country. Now, how is this being done? Let me tell you that as a college professor and as a university administrator, I have plenty to do with these various student unrests and student disorders. I can tell you with full responsibility that 98% of those, quote, kids, unquote, are basically honest, good-willing, nice, young American boys and girls or men and women. There is something wrong with them. The first, of course, is that they are full with good intentions, which then overlap, overlap into naivete. And we had, of course, a good proverb in Europe which said that the road leading towards hell is paved with good intentions. And the second thing is, I'm sorry to tell you this as their teacher and professor, that in most cases these youngsters are abysmally ignorant about the country, about the world in which they live today, about the causes, the reasons of the events, because they simply do not see how a very small minority is cleverly manipulating them for their own goals. Now, 2% behind these, these are the really dangerous ones, because these are the ones who are disciplined, these are the ones who are articulate, these are the ones who know exactly what they want. You know what these people want, actually, and do it, is this. They select certain absolutely non-controversial issues. Issues which are just as sacrosanct as is, for instance, motherhood, or was, until at least recently, the flag before they began to burn it on the street corners on the campuses. Then they select these absolutely non-controversial issues, and then this small minority which operates this whole thing attaches themselves to these issues like the barnacles to the hull of a ship, and then they can travel an awfully long distance in their direction and to fulfill their purposes. Now, which are these issues, ladies and gentlemen? The first and the most effective issue is peace. Well, naturally, all of us are for peace. We work for peace. Those of us who many of you and myself believe in God, we even pray for peace. However, what these poor, innocent kids do not know, that peace is not a one-way street. In order to have peace, it isn't enough that we should want it on this side of the street, but the other guy across the street will have the same ideas too. You see how beautiful and idealistic it would be if tomorrow we could beat all our missiles into plowshares, if we could ground all our fighter bombers, if we could mothball all our atomic submarines and spend this tremendous amount of money, those billions and dollars, for the building of hospitals and schools and universities and superhighways. But unfortunately, we cannot do it. Why? Let's suppose that tomorrow morning I would have to go through a wild animal infested jungle. Then, as a good Presbyterian, I definitely would take with me my Bible in my pocket, but I would have also a six-shooter on my belt. You know, just in case, if the tiger cannot read or if he isn't a Presbyterian, <laughs> now the other issue which this small but dedicated and deliberate minority picks out so very well and with such a great success is, of course, the environment, ecology, the fight against pollution. Well, here we notice every day those whom I call the false prophets and who will tell us that we have to rearrange our national priorities. We have to rearrange our national priorities because instead of spending all the money 
on the building of warplanes or submarines or uh, hydrogen bombs. We should spend this money on clearing up the water and the air and improving the ground. Well, we all know, of course, that our technical civilization as it is rapidly expanding, it will definitely damage the environment. This is not only our problem, it is the problem of every single industrially advanced nation, among them, for instance, Russia. And naturally, this was the reason why President Nixon, just about two months ago, I guess, I think, has asked for a $10 billion appropriation from Congress, to which should be used for this peculiar purpose. But if we would listen to these false prophets for rearranging our national priorities, then the result of this would be that one day it would be the Russians who would be breeding our clean air. And it would be the Chinese who would be swimming in our unpolluted waters. And this is certainly not something which we want to do and to see. And the third such absolutely idealistic goal is, of course, civil rights. Well, who can be opposed to civil rights? It was the absolute intention of the Constitution that each and every American citizen should have the same rights, the same privileges, and, of course, the same opportunities. However, ladies and gentlemen, when my wife and I studied for our American citizenship exam and we went through the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and all these various documents, what we discovered actually was that the Founding Fathers didn't give us only unparalleled rights and privileges, but they charged us also with duties and with obligations. Now, nobody can demand the rights and privileges unless they are willing to shoulder the burden of civic responsibilities. You know the old American song that love and marriage go together like horse and carriage. You can't have one, you can't have none, you can't have none without the other. And this goes for civil rights and civil responsibilities too. There is, however, an extremely dangerous aspect in the agitation of the small but dedicated minority when they say that they want to destroy the establishment. They want to start the second American Revolution because they can start a revolution today after all, didn't your forefathers 200 uh, some years ago start the Boston Tea Party? Or weren't they the ones who were firing the shot which was heard around the world at Lexington Bridge? Well, here is, of course, the tremendous falsehood. Because the tremendous significance of the American Revolution consists in the fact that it did not peter out in the bloodbath of the scaffolds, of the guillotine, as was its contemporary, the French Revolution. But the American Revolution ended with the establishment of an unparalleled and unprecedented constitutional system, which was based upon the rule of the majority with due respect to the interests of the minority. Under this system, everybody can find the solution the remedy for any kind of ills which bother them. Because under our present American constitutional system, you do not to need to destroy anything. You do not need to destroy the establishment because you can change the establishment. You can simply abolish the establishment and you do not need to destroy the establishment. All what you have to do is simply to get behind you the 51% majority of the voters. But this is, of course, what the so-called second American revolutionaries cannot muster, and therefore they are not revolutionaries as they claim to be. But what are they? Very simple. They are neo-Nazis, neo-fascists, and communists. Because what they want to do is exactly what Adolf Hitler has done in Germany, what Benito Mussolini has done in Italy, what Lenin and Stalin have done in Russia, namely to establish the terroristic rule of a vicious minority over the majority. 
Now, ladies and gentlemen, if we want to find our direction on the crossroads, it is high time for us now that we do something about it. Let me go here back to the very first address, which I was privileged enough to deliver three years ago to the same group here of yours, when I told you that it isn't enough for us just to talk to each other. It isn't enough to convince each other about the truth, which we not only know that it is the truth, but it is the truth. But unless we carry this out from this magic circle, from this closed TV circuit, and especially carry it to our young people, then we are lost at the crossroads. I am awfully sorry to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that during my last three addresses, there was not one in which I wouldn't have urged you, I wouldn't have begged you, I wouldn't have cajoled you, that please use your standing, your prestige as American citizens, as leaders of your community, as the members of various great organizations, carry the truth of America to our young people. Try to inject into your school system the understanding of what really the working of the American constitutional government, the blessings of our free enterprise system, and the very concept of America is. You see, I told you again and again that democracy, we are so proud of our democratic institutions. It comes from a Greek word, demos meaning people, kratia meaning the rule, demos kratia, the rule of the people, but democracy doesn't mean only the privilege to participate. Democracy doesn't mean only the right to guide and to lead. Democracy means also the obligation to learn. Democracy means also the duty to know. How do you expect these fine young generations of ours to make those very important decisions in the future if they just do not know the reason, the background? Now, ladies and gentlemen, we do not have to carry out a propaganda about America. We can afford the luxury of truth. Because we can say to our young people that America is not perfect. We have many shortcomings. We have many weak spots. Nothing can be perfect, which is the work of man. But the real greatness of America lies in the fact that it admits its weaknesses, that it wants to remedy its shortcomings. This is the real goodness of this country. And when those students, in their ignorance, parrot the word repression, I just would like them for five minutes to see what was a repression in the Nazi concentration camps and what is repression in the Chinese or in the Russian communist concentration camps. Then they would shut up. I could guarantee you this. Now, ladies and gentlemen, once more, for now the fourth time, I have to come back to this motivation for heaven's goodness sake. Do something. The only way for us is to turn towards our young people to introduce, to interject this particular approach. It must not be propaganda. We do not want to teach them conservatism or liberalism. We do not even want to teach them anti-communism. What we need so desperately in this country is not to hate more those who stand against us. But what we need so desperately, as I told you, is to know more, to love more, and to appreciate more our own institutions, our own heritage, our own traditions, which we take so appallingly for granted. Now, you see, these are really the waning years of my life. And therefore, I use this opportunity now, again, to ask you, do something. Because if you won't do something, then the only thing again, which I can repeat to you as I told it to you three years ago, then you should meditate over the words and the spirit of an old Hungarian adage, which was my own guiding light during the last very difficult 25 years of my own life. This is how it sounds in an English translation. You should work as if you would live forever and you should pray as if you would die tomorrow and if you ask me 
why was I who spoke to you here for the fourth time? I can tell you in a few words. I owe more to this country than any one of you do here in this audience. You were born with the silver spoon of American citizenship. You do not know it yet, fortunately, what it would mean to lose it. You do not yet, fortunately, what a terrible argument the muzzle of a tummy gun can be if it is pointed towards the back of your head. And I know it. I have received more from this country than any one of you here in this audience. Because I have received from this country freedom instead of oppression in my native land. I have received opportunity instead of slavery in my native land. And I have received life instead of death in my native land. And ever since, I have only two overwhelming feelings left in my heart. The one is deep humility, and the other overwhelming gratitude for being permitted to be a citizen of this much maligned country. God bless you all. Thank you. see why Dr. Nairati has been here for the last three years. It wouldn't, this rally wouldn't seem the same if Dr. Nairati wasn't here, and I do hope you'll take his message to heart. I know you will.